the recording? Hey guys, so we're going to go through a quick summary here of cellular respiration. Cellular respiration can be summarized into four major steps. One is glycolysis, second is acetyl-CoA conversion, the third is the Krebs or citric acid cycle, and then fourth is the electron transport chain. Each one of these, we've got to understand the inputs and outputs and what the major goal of each step is. Glycolysis results in two ATP and two NADH. Now, we're going to get into what these are in just a moment, but right now the best idea is to think of ATP as cellular currency. So it's the money that cell uses to buy and purchase things. That's a good analogy for it. If ATP is the money, then NADH is sort of like a debit card, an FADH2, sort of like a credit card. So we're going to take a step down through each one of these. Glycolysis is glucose splitting. Now I'm not going to go really heavy into the detail about it, but what you do is you take, a, you take glucose, which is C6H12O6, and we're going to split it into two molecules. Actually, let's draw it like we've split it. So we're going to split it into a pyruvate. Now remember, the suffix A-T-E or eight means acid, so you might see it listed as pyruvic acid, pyruvic acid, pyruvate, same thing. We're taking one six carbon molecule and we're going to split it into pyruvate or pyruvic acid. And there's two of them. Each one of these has three carbons. So we're still maintaining the same number of carbons, as you see. So that's really what we're doing in glycolysis. We're inputting glucose and we're outputting two pyruvate molecules, which are both three carbon molecules. Now the reason that we're doing that is so we can go to the next step, which is acetyl-CoA conversion. And in acetyl-CoA conversion, let's use a different color. We take the pyruvate and we convert it into acetyl-CoA. By doing this, we release two NADH. But what's interesting is one pyruvate into one acetyl-CoA is only one NADH. But if you remember, from one glucose molecule, we make two pyruvates. So thus, we get two NADH. This occurs, glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. Acetyl-CoA conversion Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle and electron transport chain all occur within the mitochondria. So this is the only one that's occurring outside of the mitochondria. This is now in the mitochondria. Now that we have acetyl-CoA, we can enter into the citric acid cycle. Now, again, the citric acid cycle is really complex. We're just going to go over just a little bit of it. A really good way to think about it is a circle, just like a clock. Since it's a cycle, it'll begin and end with the same thing. Acetyl-CoA comes in right here. And what's released, the CoA sort of falls off. The Acetyl-CoA comes in and joins up with another molecule, and the first molecule formed is citric acid. So this is why it's now referred to as the citric acid cycle. What happens is, is there's a lot of chemistry going on throughout the cycle. This is not super important for this portion of the course. What we're going to focus on is what's generated. And what's generated per one molecule of glucose, which is two cycles in here. So remember, one molecule of glucose splits into two pyruvates. These two pyruvates then each are converted into acetyl-CoA and then one acetyl-CoA will come into the citric acid cycle. And then you'll release an NADH, uh, uh, see another NADH about right here, an ATP, an FADH2, and then finally another NADH. But if you count them, you have one, two, three NADHs. You have one ATP and one FADH2. That's for one pyruvate. How many pyruvates do you have? You have two. So you have to multiply that by two. That's why you have six NADH, 
two ATP and two FADH2. That's where these molecules come from. So remember, ATP is like the money, NADH is like the debit card, FADH2 is like the credit card. So now we have to go down to the next spot, which is the electron transport chain. And I'm going to use an image from your textbook on it that describes a little bit better than I can. This is the electron transport chain. As you see here, this is inside the mitochondria. You can follow along here. This is a cytoplasm outside, so this is the outer membrane and the inner membrane of a mitochondria. Remember, mitochondria are double-folded. You have an outside folding and then inside folding as well. So we're focused on the inner membrane. And then we have the electron transport chain occurring here. And that's just, it's a set of proteins that strip electrons off of NADH and FADH2. As you see, NADH comes in here, the electrons are stripped off, leaving you with only NADH, and then the hydrogens, or excuse me, NAD+, plus, the hydrogens then enter this intermembrane compartment. But it's a specific kind of hydrogen, 2H+. Plus. That's essentially a proton. So these protons build in this compartment. FADH2, same concept. And as these protons build, there's more protons on the inside of the inner membrane than the outside. So they have to escape somehow because we know that nature doesn't like things out of balance. We have to balance things just like we would a ruler. So since we have too many on the inside, some have got to exit. And they can only exit through one pore. And that's this opening of the ATP synthase. And it even sounds like synthesis. Remember ASE? ASEs are your proteins. So ATP synthase, this is going to formulate ATP. So as these hydrogens come through, it actually turns this. Imagine gears and a molecular motor turning. And as the hydrogens come through, it spins and turns and allows us to perform something called chemiosmotic phosphorylation. All that means, it's a big, long, complex word that means we're taking ADP plus a phosphorus, which is adosine diphosphate plus a phosphate, and we're turning it into ATP which is triphosphate. So we're going from two phosphoruses plus another one into a one molecule with three phosphoruses. And as you remember, ATP, that is the cellular currency. So that's the whole concept of the electron transport chain. At the end here, the end final electron acceptor is oxygen. Oxygen is not used in glycolysis, acetyl-CoA conversion, nor the Krebs slash citric acid cycle. The only place it's used in cellular respiration, specifically aerobic respiration, is the final electron acceptor of the electron transport chain. Remember, oxygen has a high affinity for electrons, meaning it has a high electronegativity, or it's an electron bully. It wants electrons, and it's going to steal them from wherever it can get them. So if you put, elect if you put oxygen here, it's really going to draw these electrons through, just like a magnet would. And as it draws them through, you're able to release those hydrogen ions into this compartment here, sending them through, generating ATP. So it's not the electron transport chain itself that makes ATP. It's the ATP synthase. But you have to have the electron transport chain in order to get the uh, equilibrium or the non-equilibrium established here for the protons uh, on the inner membrane and the outer membrane. So you have to have that unequal, it's called a proton gradient, in which you have more in one side than another. It has to be equaled out. And as it starts balancing out, you're sending them through, spinning that motor, creating ATP synthesis. So now that we have this concept, we need to figure out, well, how 